Organisms that can secure energy for themselves from non-living sources are referred to as autotrophs, and this means self-feeders. Now, this is not unique to any one category of organism. For example, in deep sea hydrothermal vents, you'll find chemoautotrophic bacteria that are able to take sulfur based compounds that are spewing out of the earth and transform those chemicals from stored chemical energy that's inside them into usable chemical energy for their cells. And there are organisms that eat those bacteria, and you get thriving ecosystems based on those chemoautotrophic bacteria. But for the rest of the ecosystems on the planet, the basis of them, the, the raw energy for those ecosystems is being captured from sunlight. So photosynthesis is the interface between the non-living realm and the living realm. This is how energy gets into the biosphere in the first place, in all but the very most narrow of cases where there's an exception for that. Animals and fungi have to feed on recently uh, dead organisms in order to survive, or in some rare cases, uh, still currently living organisms in order to survive. They are therefore called other feeders, not autotrophs, heterotrophs. But if you want to talk about photosynthetic organisms, there's actually quite a wide variety. You have unicellular bacteria that are able to do photosynthesis. You might hear the term cyanobacteria thrown around. These are very simple organisms that are able to do photosynthesis, and they use their own cell membrane in order to accomplish the task. So everything we're going to talk about that takes place inside of plant cells also happens inside of these bacteria, except they don't have chloroplasts to do the job for them. They use their own cell membrane to do the job instead. But all larger cells use chloroplasts to do photosynthesis, and that might include single-celled organisms like these euglena right here, or multicellular protists like, for example, seaweed, which is an algae, not a plant, a protist, not a plant. But in terms of our cultural awareness, I would say that the plants are the most dominant form of life that we think about when it comes to photosynthesis, which makes sense because we live in terrestrial ecosystems. And in terrestrial ecosystems, land-based ecosystems, the plants are the dominant life form. They are what gives all of the structure to the ecosystem. So that's where our thoughts are generally going to go. So we're going to talk about photosynthesis as conducted by the plants. And there's quite a bit of variety in photosynthesis in just the realm of the plants, so there should be plenty to keep us busy. Now you've all seen this equation before. This is the super simplified equation for photosynthesis. Photosynthesis takes six carbon dioxide molecules and six water molecules, and then uses the energy in sunlight to rearrange those molecules in order to form glucose, C6H12O6, tattoo it on your chest if you have to, you will need to know C6H12O6 this unit. And as a bonus, you get six O2 molecules. Here I animated that a little bit so you can see the process uh, occurring. Now this general equation hides all of the complexity of photosynthesis, because this just makes it look like we're mixing together carbon dioxide and water and getting sugar and oxygen out the other side. But if you do that, if you just mix together carbon dioxide and water, you get carbonic acid no matter how much sunlight you flood your system with. So there's something else going on. And it also makes it look like we're directly reacting the water and the carbon dioxide together, which is actually not the case. The first thing that happens in photosynthesis is all of these water molecules you see on the left hand of the equation, they actually get split and they form these O2 molecules that you see over here on the right hand side of the equation. So water disappears and oxygen is formed in basically step one of photosynthesis. And then all of the other steps are how carbon dioxide gets rearranged to form C6H12O6. Where do the hydrogens come from? Well, the hydrogens get split off from the oxygen, so there's plenty of spare hydrogens floating around, and eventually they end up back onto this molecule, so they do get involved somewhere. But you can see there's a lot of complexity there. And there's also a question of how sunlight is getting in there. Sometimes we heat up 
a chemical reaction or to give it a little bit more energy, right? We just let the molecules crash into each other a little bit more frequently. But photosynthesis is not that crass. It's not that brutish. The energy has to be captured in a very particular way in order to allow this to go forward. So we're going to talk about how the proteins, the pigments inside of plant cells are able to capture sunlight and utilize that energy using something called the photoelectric effect. There's going to be some physics involved. There's going to be a little bit of something like electrical engineering involved because essentially photosynthesis is kind of like setting up a circuit, an electrical circuit. It's really cool stuff. But before we can get to all the physics and the photoelectric effect, I got to give you a tour of the factory so you know where we're working here. This is a cross section of a leaf and a leaf is set up to maximize the efficiency of photosynthesis. So we're going to look at all the different parts here, and I'm going to have this diagram on the unit three exam. So you're going to want to know these parts and what they do as well. This one here, sclerenchyma fiber, that's not one you're going to need to know. That's just some tough fibers. There's three different kinds of uh, plant tissue we talk about, parenchyma, sclerenchyma, and cholenchyma. If you want to know more about them, take Dr. Aquilani's botany course. But up top, you can see this layer, this kind of gray layer, which is a waxy outer coating on the leaf. It's called the cuticle. So just like you have cuticles, the leaf has a cuticle. This waxy outer coating is there for waterproofing reasons. You ever seen water beat up on the surface of a leaf? That's because it has this hydrophobic coating on the outside that prevents water from getting in and out. And the reason why the leaf is concerned with water loss is because water is a vital ingredient of photosynthesis, even in addition to just maintaining the turgor pressure inside plant cells. And a lot of behaviors that plants have have to do with preventing water loss. That's why deciduous trees drop their leaves every fall, is to prevent unnecessary water loss during the cold season. So the waxy outer coating prevents that excessive water loss during hot, dry periods. Just below that, we have the epidermis, which you'll notice there's not a lot of chloroplasts in these epidermis cells. The epidermis is there to help absorb water and minerals in the roots, and it protects against water loss in the shoots. Uh, it's there as another protective coating, and because it doesn't have a whole lot of materials inside, and it's just one layer of cells, it lets a lot of sunlight on through. So it helps regulate uh, the passage of materials, it forms a nice protective coating underneath that cuticle, uh, but it doesn't do a lot of the photosynthesis. Then we end up in some of these layers down here, which we call the mesophyll. And from a photosynthesis perspective, the mesophyll is where the action is happening. But you might notice that the mesophyll is actually divided into two separate layers. You have this kind of dense region on top here, which is called the palisade mesophyll. And then you have this airy region, this kind of like sparsely populated region called the spongy mesophyll down here. It looks like if you were inside here, like if you were to shrink down and, and go around in here, you could crawl your way through the spongy mesophyll, but you couldn't do the same with the palisade mesophyll. Now, the reason why these are set up like that, when sun comes down and hits a leaf, it's probably going to hit the palisade mesophyll first because that's the top of the leaf, right? So you're going to get a lot of sunlight coming through that top part. So you're going to want to pack as many chloroplasts up there as you possibly can. And every time the sunlight has to go through a layer of cell wall, uh, it's going to be diminished ever so slightly. So you want very few cell walls in your way. You don't want a lot of layers of cells in your way. So that's why the palisade mesophyll cells are set up like this. They're elongated so that you don't have layers and layers of cells, but you can have lots and lots and lots of chloroplasts all within the same cell. So we're maximizing the efficiency of photosynthesis in this region. We're maximizing the capture of sunlight in the palisade mesophyll. But 
some of the ingredients you need for photosynthesis, well, you need to take in carbon dioxide, and you need to pump out O2, and if O2 builds up too much in the leaf, it actually decreases the efficiency of photosynthesis. So you need to be able to get rid of oxygen and bring in carbon dioxide. So to facilitate that gas exchange, that's why the spongy mesophyll has all of these air pockets inside to make sure that there's a good mixing of gases inside and outside of the leaf and allow them to kind of flow in and out. But there's still some light available there. So you still want the cells that have chloroplasts, hence you can see in the spongy mesophyll, there's still some chloroplasts in these cells, but you just want these air pockets to help you mix the gases together and facilitate gas exchange. Now, how are the gases getting in and out of the leaf? Well, we have these little pores here, which are called stomata. And stomata kind of serve as the nostrils of a leaf. They are pores that allow gases in and out. Now, these purple cells that you see on either side of the stoma, these are called guard cells. Guard cells can inflate with water, uh, making themselves much, much larger. And when they inflate themselves with water, they essentially close up the pores. They close up the stoma, or the stoma, stomata is plural, stoma is, is singular. Uh, they close up that stoma to prevent any more gas exchange. So if it's a very, very hot, dry day, you might be more worried about water evaporating through this leaf than you are about conducting photosynthesis efficiently. So it might be a good idea to close your stomata and prevent water from escaping. Like that might be the resource that you want to make sure that you hang on to a little bit more. So that's what those guard cells are there to do. They're also there to regulate gas exchange, but also prevent water loss if necessary. For photosynthesis, there's some other ingredients that are required, namely water. And water is collected down by the roots of a plant, and it's got to travel all the way up to these leaves. How does it do that? It does it through the leaf vein. There are two varieties of vascular tissue that you find inside the veins, the xylem and the phloem. The xylem is the water, uh, and some minerals as well, transporting tissue. So this is the route that water takes to get from the roots all the way up to the leaves. And we talked, when we talked about the property of water, about capillary action. And we talked, when we talked about osmosis, about how water moves from cell to cell as well. So you know that water travels up these roots against the force of gravity and eventually finds its way up to the leaves. Now, an interesting thing that happens is once it gets up to these leaves, it actually is allowed to evaporate a little bit. Something called transpiration happens, where you get evaporation from the leaves. That's what these guard cells are there to control. But because water is always evaporating out, you have a constant flow, a one-way direction of flow of water from the roots up to the leaves. So you constantly get this movement of material going up the vascular tissue of the plant. So we know that we need carbon dioxide and water, and now we know where they come from. The carbon dioxide comes in through these stomata, and the water comes in through the xylem. Now what's the phloem for? The phloem is for sugar transport, for nutrients. So once the sugars are made, it's going to get packed into the phloem and delivered throughout the entire rest of the plant. The cells, these dark blue cells that are around the outside of the vein, these are called bundle sheath cells. And in certain kinds of plants, they have a very important function in photosynthesis. Uh, some types of plants which are adapted for very hot, dry type conditions will store excess CO2 in the form of a 4-carbon acid inside of these bundle sheath cells and then be able to use it a little bit later on. So they do all of the, essentially the second half of photosynthesis, they do all of that here at the bundle sheath. So that serves multiple functions. Not only does it protect the vascular tissue here in the vein, but sometimes it forms a very important part of photosynthesis as well. Corn would be an example of a C4 plant that, that does that kind of mechanism. Now that's just the anatomy of a leaf. If we want to talk about photosynthesis, we got to dive deeper than that because you know the real action happens in the chloroplasts. Here we see the cross-section of the leaf up top, and then you can see that they took 
a single plant cell and you can see all the little chloroplasts clustered up inside of it. So it's clearly a mesophyll cell. Mesophyll cells are gonna have most of the chloroplasts. That's where all the photosynthesis action happens. And then we take a single one of those chloroplasts and they've diagrammed that out as well. And yes, you are gonna to need to know all of the parts of a chloroplast as well. So the first thing to note is that not only is this a membrane bound organelle, this is membranes on membranes on membranes. The outside of a chloroplast is bound by two separate membranes. You have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And these have slightly different properties about what types of materials they will allow in and out. But we are really interested in the space inside those two membranes. So the interior of the chloroplast has this space on the inside, which we call the stroma. The stroma is the pocket inside the inner membrane where all of these little green pancakes are clustered together. It's that whole compartment there. So that's the stroma of the chloroplast. That's going to be important later. Then we have all of these green stacks of pancakes themselves. These green guys are called thylakoid. A thylakoid is just one of these little flat ovals, one of these flat discs. And these stacks that they're stacked up into, every single little column of them is referred to as a granum. Plural would be grana. So here you can see a whole bunch of different grana. You can see about 20 grana each granum being made up of about five to eight different thylakoids, but all of these grana are inside the stroma, and the stroma is inside of the chloroplast. Now, inside the thylakoid, inside the thylakoid, yet we're getting even deeper here, inside of it is another space, and here it's labeled the thylakoid space. That's a pretty easy way to remember it, and I will accept that answer uh, if it's an open answer, but there's a name that I prefer, which is the lumen. Lumen in anatomy and physiology, right, is any open cavity inside of your body. So if you were to do a cross section of uh, someone's intestines, the open space in the center where the material flows through, where the food flows through, that would be the lumen. And the reason why I like lumen is because it sounds like illumination, and this is part of the mechanics of photosynthesis. This is where part of the action happens. Uh, so I really like calling that compartment the lumen. So the thylakoid has a lumen inside of it, that's the space inside, and all of the light capturing machinery, all of the pigment molecules that actually capture sunlight, they are on the thylakoid membrane. They're on the outside of the thylakoid. Remember how I talked about how important membranes are and that one of the reasons why they're important is they can have all these embedded proteins inside of them and other embedded molecules, that they're a fluid mosaic, right? You remember that term? And that you can have all kinds of interesting metabolic work being conducted on the membranes of cells. Well, Here's gonna be an example of one. The thylakoid membrane is what actually captures solar energy and then harnesses that, and then we're gonna turn it into chemical energy. We're gonna turn it as stored chemical potential energy. And we'll talk about exactly how that is accomplished in the very next video.